Hi everyone, my name is Florence Ostand. I'm the curator of Negoshi exhibition at the Barbican. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our online event, Negoshi Conversations, on the theme of friendship and community. Isamu Noguchi's multifaceted career as a sculptor was very much developed through his many professional and Japan, his journey was interwoven with stories of friendships, collaborations, and partnerships that transcended borders and produced a rich body of sculptures, from theater sets to playground models, from landscape designs to furniture and lighting. Taking inspiration from his approach, this conversation will reflect on friendship and community as methodologies that can inspire and inform artistic and curatorial practices. With a series of conversations, we are celebrating the final week of our exhibition here in London, dedicated to the Japanese American sculptor. This moment marks the completion of the research platform Noguchi Resonances bringing together a remarkable constellation of voices and truly fantastic participants who have shaped and developed a contemporary and compelling response to Noguchi's work in the present. Podcasts, letters and audio essays from artists and researchers are rethinking Noguchi's artistic legacy. You can access all this content on our Barbican website. Noguchi Resonances is a digital resi residency curated by Aniel Kwan, who will be moderating tonight's event in dialogue with artist curators Viet Le and Adriel Lewis, who will discuss working in and through friendship, especially with the challenges faced by the Asian artistic and academic communities in the US and beyond. We would like to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art and the US Embassy in London for their support to this event. It is now my pleasure to introduce Sani Yael Kwan, an independent curator and researcher. Her exhibition making, programming, publication and teaching practice is located at the intersection of contemporary art, art history and cultural activism with interest in archives, histories, feminist, queer and alternative knowledges collective practices and solidarity. She is director of Something Human, a curatorial initiative that launched the pioneering Southeast Asia Performance Collection. She curated the archive in residence exhibition Southeast Asia Performance Collection at Haus der Kunst in Munich in 2019. And she's currently curator in residence at FACT Liverpool, where she has curated the exhibition Futures Ages Will Wander. She leads Asia Art Activism, AAA, an interdisciplinary, intergenerational research platform network exploring the entanglements between Asia, art and activism, and is the instigating council member of Asia Forum. She is a recipient of a Diverse Actions Leadership Award, and she currently teaches critical studies at Central St. Martin University of the Arts, London, and writing and curating at Cask School of Art in Ghent. It is my pleasure to welcome you, Annie, and your guest. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Florence, for that very kind and warm introduction. And thank you to the Barbican for hosting this project. And hello, Viet and Adriel. <laughs> Good to see you both. It has been a pleasure to work on the Gucci Resonances, which has been an occasion to bring together old and new collaborators and friends digitally to reconsider the way we come together and work. I mean, this has been particularly critical after experience of the pandemic these last two years, which has impacted us in terms of how we experience the relational time, health and mutuality. And it also urges us towards thinking about how we work in the art world with our different institutional legacies in the US, UK and internationally. So in the first of these two Noguchi live conversations, we will be exploring what friendship and community means, especially in the wake of the political upheavals and anti-Asian violence that surged and the re-emergence for the need for Black Lives Matter as the pandemic unfolded. And I have with me two uh, amazing artist curators that I've had the pleasure to encounter and work with. So Adriel Lewis, um, as a community organizer, artist, writer, and curator, who believes that collective liberation can happen in poetic ways. 
His life's work is focused on the mutual thriving of artistic integrity and social vigilance. He's a part of Ill Literacy Arts Collective, which creates music and media to strengthen Black and Asian coalitions, and is creative director of Belm Shell To, a collective, a collaborative of artists and leaders from frontline communities responding to nuclear histories. Adriel is the curator of digital and emerging practice at the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center, where he advocates for equitable practices in museums and institutions. His ancestors are rooted in Toysan, China, and migrated through Hong Kong, Mexico, and the United States. Adriel was born on Ohlone land. I hope I said that correctly, Adriel. Please correct me later. On a personal note, Adriel, I met many years ago in 2015, and speaking of friendship, we met because we attended a mutual friends um, performance, uh, the artist Anita Yo Ali in Singapore. And I feel really privileged that over the years, we've had many opportunities to speak together, travel together, eat together and work together. <laughs> and joining us also today is Viet Le, who is an academic artist, writer and curator, whose work centers on spiritualities, trauma, healing and sexualities with a focus on Southeast Asia and its diasporas. Dr. Lei is the author of Return Engagements, Contemporary Arts Traumas of Modernity and History in Saigon and Phnom Penh, which is published by Duke University Press in 2021. The art book White Gaze is a collaboration with La Tipa, which is published by Smigs Books in 2019. Lei has presented his work internationally at the Bant Center, Bangkok Art and Cultural Center, Shanghai Biennale, the Rio Gay Film Festival, among other venues. The Transpop Korea Vietnam Remix, which is in Arco Seoul Gallery, Queen Saigon, UC Irvine Gallery, YBCA San Francisco between 2008 and 2009, and the 2012 Guangdu Biennale in Taipei, A Love in the Time of War in UC Santa Barbara, as well as SF Camera Work in 2016. They is a board member of Queer Cultural Center and Art Matters, and an associate professor of visual cultures, visual studies, at California College of the Arts and currently a Stanford CCSRE Mellon Arts Fellow. And I'm also really glad to mention that all three of us have intersected repeatedly via the platform GAX, also known as Global Asia Pacific Art Exchange, which is led by Dr. Alexander Trang, who will be participating in the second conversation with John Tain. And I also recall actually, we had uh, you co-edit the Asian Diaspora Visual Cultures and Americans Journal with Alex, where you kindly invited both me and Adria to contribute, <laughs> which happened right before the pandemic. And I guess this is such an opportunity for us all to sort of reconnect and relink those conversations that we had. So I really want to thank you for making time to join us for this conversation. So I think for the audience, I just want to explain also that I've allowed myself a little indulgence here to kind of detail the way that we've been entangled and interacting over the years, which has brought up so many good memories. You know, uh, I do remember a tarot card session, you know, after the session at the Smithsonian, you know, which was quite memorable. And since working on Noguchi Resonance and exploring the wonderful archive at the Noguchi Museum, you know, it has really been a journey of thinking about the ways in which we interact and how our stories are entwined with certain people, friends and colleagues over many years in generative and supportive ways. And, you know, reading about Noguchi and his friendship with our Buckminster Fuller and Shoji Sada, where they had long-standing friendship and collaborative partnerships. So Noguchi and Fuller, or Bucky as he would like to be called, um, they had met all the way back in 1929 you know, they drank together, traveled together, even lived together at some point uh, in the post-depression era. And they spoke about philosophy and ideas and over their shared fascination with technology um, and the possibility of a utopian world. And they stayed close friends and in touch really across many decades till 1983, when Fuller died just before his 88th birthday. And they had also worked closely individually as well with Japanese American architect Shoji Shadao and Fuller and Sarao set up a studio together and Sarao worked with Noguchi on his famous Akari lamps and also remained a very close friend till Noguchi passed away in 1988. So Sarao was also the former director of the Noguchi Museum. And reading their correspondence, which sort of, you know, uh, spans uh, letters where they're very professional and talking about what has to be done and so on, to very heartfelt um, reminiscences and expressions of affection 
between them, you know, it, it was very moving and, and sort of really affected me in a very visceral way. Um, and it made me think about how friendships, you know, sometimes we have collaborative um, partnerships that are very successful and other times not, you know, and yet is it still possible to stay close friends and Fuller's ideas, you know, were notably a great influence on Noguchi's work. And Sada also helped Noguchi realize many of his projects. So I think here, you know, we start to acknowledge that the existence of friendship uh, is in parallel and also entwined with a lot of the ways that we work uh, in the art world. And maybe today we have an opportunity to untangle that a little bit and reflect on what that means for each of us. So here, Viet, I'll hand over to you first to respond with some thoughts. And then, Adriel, you'll follow Viet. So, handing it over. Thank you. Thanks, Annie, for that warm introduction. And it's a pleasure and honor to reconnect with you and Adriel and be in conversation. I also would like to thank Florence, Sarah, David, the Barbican, and of course, all of you um, joining us virtually. And so today I'm gonna talk for about 15 minutes and think through uh, rhizomatic points and provocations around the uh, framework, uh, community and friendship. So I'm gonna share my screen um, and here we go. So, I see the terms friendship, community, loss, intimacies, and times as connected keywords. And Annie suggested that I start with uh, positioning myself my journey a little bit. I'm speaking with you today from Ohlone territory, the San Francisco Bay Area. But I started my journey uh, in Saigon, Vietnam, and this is a picture of my mom and I before the Vietnam War ended. And right before I was three, I would embark on a journey on a boat, escaping Vietnam as a boat refugee. And this is another map. Uh, what we call the Vietnam War is a series of entanglements, military engagements in Southeast Asia, comprising Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, etc. And this is a map of Nixon's secret bombings, 2.7 million tons of bombs dropped to stop communism in the area. So some of my life's work as an adult is to really think through and against what I call pornography of violence in terms of representations of refugees, immigrants, exiles. Today in the news and mass media, if you see my shirt, newsprint, uh, we see a lot of images of boat refugees, Syrian, North Africans, um, suffering spectacles. So my work both academically, curatorially and artistically argues against this pornography of violence and towards a return engagement, uh, returning to shadow sites, difficult sites as uh, alternate discrepant timelines. And so again, um, the keywords, community, friendship, lost intimacies and times, which we'll unpack. And of course, this idea of keywords comes from Raymond William. And um, in his book, Keywords, there's a long entry on community, which he, says starts since the 14th century and originally started as a more of a direct relationship in terms of common goods but became a more of an abstract um, relationality and it's interesting that he says that community can be the quote warmly persuasive word to describe it as the existing set of relationship and what most what is most important perhaps is that unlike all other terms of social organization state nation society etc it seems to never be used unfavorably. So, and we can see this happening in the kind of common uh, usage of the term community within institutions or uh, informally. But since he's written this, other scholars have um, sensed that the ubiquity of the term uh, also may affect it. So, Miranda Joseph writes, quote, in the late, 18, late 20th and early 21st century, United States, the term community is used so pervasively that it would appear to be meaningless. And then Terry Eagleton in the uh, Keywords Journal echoes the sentiment. Community is one of those words I highlight on here on the left, which can mean everything or anything and means little to nothing. So back to Miranda. Um, 
quote, community is performatively constituted in capitalism through processes of production and consumption, through discourses of pluralism, multiculturalism, and diversity, and through niche marketing, niche production, and divisions of labor, race, gender, and nation. So capitalism and empire has subsumed this word community um, as a sort of veneer. But let's have another take on the term community. So instead of capitalist um, assumption of community or uh, taking on the term community, community, uh, John Luke Nancy argues, is not necessarily something that is in the surface of capitalism, but actually community can be against capitalist ac uh, um, accommodations or uh, accumulation, right? So I was really interested in this idea of community and loss. So he writes in the operative community, community is revealed in the death of others, hence it is always revealed to others. And so I thought about, okay, how, what does that really mean? And then community is what takes place always through others and for others. So in the book, he talks about community not necessarily as something that is a product, that is work. Community is something that happens as a process without a result. And this is what he means by loss. And I'm also really interested in this idea of loss and relationality. And to extend it to the other keyword, friendship, Derrida talks about friendship as predicated precisely on loss, just as John Luke Nancy talks about community as predicated on loss. Quote, to have a friend, to look at him or her, to follow them with your eyes, admire them in friendship, is to know in a more intense way, already injured, always insistent, and more and more unforgettable that one of the two of you will inevitably see the other die. One of us each says to himself, the day will come when one of the two of us will no longer see the other. That is the infinitely small tear. So from the first moment, the friends become virtual survivors. Friends know this and friendships breathe this knowledge right up to the last breath. So this idea of loss, and I also think of uh, Bart's in terms of the photographic image, absence and presence. So friendship community is infused with loss. But I also think of other scholars that are talking about loss, not necessarily as a negative, thing but as a possibly generative space and opening up think of david ang and david Konstantin, other theorists such as halberstam on failure so and um, alpesh patel's amazing book uh, on productive failure in south asian art history so this idea that western capitalist logic is about a accumulation but what do we what opens up when we think of loss right of um non-accumulation, a process of intimacies. And so my book also uh, in the introduction and the rest of the book talks about, builds upon this theory of loss and return. When you return in terms of, you know, it conjures up this idea of physical return, but then also fiscal returns. When you think through these ideas of loss and return, what opens up? And of course, with loss, we think of grief. And Butler talks about grief as a resource. Oftentimes, we think of grief or loss as something that's isolating, right? And through these past few years, we have been quite isolated. And But grief itself can be a resource for politics. I'm paraphrasing Butler. And it's not something that resigns us to inaction, but it is actually a slow process in which we identify with suffering and instead of being isolated in a narcissistic melancholic loop, we open ourselves to vulnerability of others and it becomes a politics. And I think of other processes um, and responses to grief and grievance, particularly this exhibition uh, curated by Okwi Enwenzer at the New Museum. Sarah, can you please play the The crystallization of black grief in the face of a politically orchestrated white grievance represents the fulcrum of this exhibition. The exhibition is devoted to examining modes of representation in different mediums where artists have addressed the concept of mourning, commemoration, and loss as a direct response to the national emergency of black grief. Included in Grief and Grievance are works encompassing video, painting, sculpture, installation, photography, sound, and choreography all made 
with a handful of key exceptions, during the last decade. Okuyan Wizor had conceived the exhibition Grief and Grievance Art and Mourning in America in 2018. I had met and known Okui since uh, 1998, uh, and uh, for a few years, between 2008 and uh, 2015, we found ourselves working for the same institutions, and so had the opportunity to work on similar projects and be frequently in contact. Okui sadly died on March 15th, 2019, and uh, so after Okui's passing, uh, we spoke with Glenn Ligon, we spoke with many of Okui's friends, with his family, with his partner, and with many of the artists. Together, uh, we decided we needed to complete this show, and uh, so we created a curatorial advisory group composed by Glenn Ligon, who had known Okui since the 1990s, and Mark Nash, who was both a friend and a collaborator, a co-curator of Okui's many exhibitions, and Naomi Beckwith, a younger curator who uh, Okui had been in dialogue with throughout the years and had uh, invited to be part of his 2015 uh, Venice Biennial Jury. Thank you, Sarah. And Okui was a colleague and uh, also to think about the idea again of loss, community, friendship. And loss is a generative space that opens up other possibilities. And I think of the Black Lives Matters movement and um, you know, white supremacist civil, uh, white supremacist statues being toppled and um, you know, uh, ch changing the narrative. I also think of loss, grief, and grievance in terms of stop Asian hate and the rise of um, Asian hate crimes within the past few years, but then also community responses. But I also want to highlight longer timelines of loss, community, friendship, grief, and grievance in terms of in the United States, anti-immigrant sentiment, which, uh, you know, affected Irish Americans who were racialized um, a certain way, as you've seen this image, eating Uncle Sam, Asian immigrants and East European immigrants, and then the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, and uh, this compelling book by artist Ken Gonzalez Day, Lynching in the West, which traces violence lynchings affecting not only African Americans, but Asian Americans, Latinx communities as part and parcel of the normalization of structural violence to keep the status quo. So these violences, um, these inequities are nothing new, right? They are part and parcel of uh, implicit institutional structures. So what can we do? And in terms of thinking of communities, loss, grief, grievance, I think of cross-ethnic solidarities, um, this image, 1969, rally for Huey P. Luton, uh, Newton, sorry, and then more recent protests and solidarities and uprisings. Um, and I think of the term intimacies, what does that mean? And I'm indebted to Lisa Lowe's work on the intimacies of four continents. And she talks about what we think as separate struggles, indigenous rights, um, civil rights, queer, LGBTQIA politics, stop Asian hate, Black Lives Matters, as actually really thinking through and affected by the very roots of supremacy, which we all are complicit in perpetuating, and also disciplines as structures of violence. And so how do we think through intimacies differently? And I am indebted to Foucault, who talks about intimacy, especially queer intimacy, apart from this dyad of friend, lover, you know, work, personal, friendship is a way of life. So. He talks about in this interview, writes about how intimacies can yield an intense set of relations not resembling those that are institutionalized. And this ties back to this idea of community and John Luke Nancy that it's beyond this capitalist accumulation. It's about process, about relationality. That's not about this thing that is visible or legible. And I also think about other timelines and other pandemics. And of course, I'm a, uh, HIV AIDS activists, and I did lose many friends, um, you know, in the 80s and 90s, 
And of course, this year, um, my friend and mentor, Douglas Crimp, who's a profound friend, academic curator, um, HIV AIDS activist. But loss, again, can be a generative space. And to think through intimacies and then the last segment and institutions and the alternate titles, Noguchi and Friends. Well, this is a trace of institutional connections through the figure of Noguchi spanning space and time. So Sarah, can you please play the second video? But you know, when shifts I do, uh, backwards and forwards, sometimes I think I'm part of this world uh, of today. Sometimes I feel that, uh, uh, that uh, maybe I belong in history or in prehistory or that there is no such thing as time. But if you're caught in time, uh, or a, the immediate present time, then your, your, your choice is very limited. You can only do certain things really correctly belonging to that time. You see. But if you want to escape from that time constraint, uh, then the whole world, you see, I mean, not just the most industrialized world, but the whole world is someplace where you belong. And I see Noguchi talking about time Right against this idea, this Western Enlightenment construct of theological accumulation, accumulationist modernist time, right? Uh, to think about other modalities of time, cyclical time, as opening to other histories and other art histories. And speaking of which, um, I was honored to be a part of a 2012 revision. American art history. And so on the far right, you see upper right corner, the two directors, Margo Machida, who talks about informally that our work as POC, BIPOC, activists, scholars, artists, as being termites within art and art history, really radically shifting, undermining the foundations of these art histories uh, that we've received. And Alexandra Chang, who's speaking on Thursday with John Tain, and uh, on the bottom left, you see us in front of a Louis Vuitton Yayoi Kusama installation because uh, Yayoi had an exhibition on archives at the Whitney also that year, so we had different case studies. But in thinking again about lost community friendships, um, the late Karen Higa, a wonderful friend curator, uh, gave a talk about Noguchi, a critical talk about Noguchi and his legacy uh, as part of the three week convening. And so this is us at the Noguchi Museum. And um, this is a catalog for an exhibition she curated at the Japanese American National Museum uh, called One Way or Another, rethinking the formulations of identitarian politics. And even though the Institute was not really predicated on producing anything, um, relationships, friendships, projects uh, organically um, grew. So these are some of the books that have happened since, and there have been exhibitions, shows, etc. And so it's been a wonderful community. And also as a result of this initial convening, the Asian Diasporic Visual Cultures in the Americas, which encompasses North America and South America and Latin America, thinking through diaspora. Um, this is just uh, it's various convenings. Um, through friends and community members in different places in New York, et cetera, um, at different launches. And then second institutional site in Intimacy is an exhibition at the Asian Art Museum, which traveled. Um, and Sarah, can you please play the third video? So this exhibition really highlighted Noguchi and Hasegawa's friendship when Noguchi returned the second time to Japan in the 1950s. 
And as part of this exhibition, there was also a formal closed gathering of artists and friends. Um, and some of us are here, Margot Machida, Mark Johnson, Michael Arcega, Renu Mukherjee, Wesson Turia, Kenneth Lowe, and myself. And then there was also a um, formal public presentation, again, thinking about these nodes of friendships and transnational relationalities. And finally, um, Sarah, could you please play the very last video? Noguchi and Hasegawa, in their own words. Saburo Hasegawa and Isamu Noguchi met in 1950 and developed a profound connection. I think most of you know the name of Isamu Noguchi, the Japanese-American sculptor. Voice of Saburo Hasegawa. When he came back to Japan, more than 20 years absent, I took him round in Japan when we were at the Sun Rock Garden. He was so impressed, he whispered to me, Mr. Hasegawa, this is terrific. Change. Hasegawa, when I met him, was already turning away from his previous interests in European culture and art toward a rediscovery of his own country, Isamu Noguchi. I changed with the, with the work. I mean, you know, so much is uh, today, you know, what they call conceptual. I consider conceptual things as a base. That's where you, you start from. But uh, the discovery is in the accidents and, and all sorts of things that happen which uh, make you change your mind. You're, uh, I'm never absolutely fixed about anything. I love the old abstract art of Japan. And I am really trying to do the revival of it. But more and more, I begin to believe this could be done and had to be done in the way it has international scale. I would like to make the revival of Japanese abstract art of the past in international scale. And what I want to highlight in terms of what Hasegawa said was this revival of Japanese abstraction. So really tracing a discrepant timeline of modernity from the ones we've inherited in terms of thinking about Western avant-garde being original, but actually really indebted to Asian and African, uh, you know, uh, breakthroughs. So I am also thinking about, I mean, Temple's book, Kutai, Decentering Modernism, which traces, again, a discrepant uh, lineage of modernity beyond, as what Noguchi was saying, what we think of as these normal timelines that we inherit the rest of the world. And so in closing, I want to go back in time and think through our journeys and our communities and our loss and our grief and our grievance and the generative spaces and intimacies that this allows for. So thank you and hope we can talk more about friendship, community, loss, intimacies, and time. Thank you so much, Viet. Um, I think we will bring Adriel on now to respond and then we'll reconvene for the conversation. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Viet. That was oh, so good to just take in. And it's, it's the morning out here, as you know, um, as we are sharing our time. Uh, so this is such a beautiful way to start the day. Um, thank you, Annie, for having having us. Uh, thank you, Barbican. Uh, just um, am increasingly cherishing these kinds of moments for us to come together, um, even if it's kind of from our own from our own pods. Uh, so um, I, uh, I I'm tuning into you from Thangna, uh, which is also known as Venice, California. Uh, today in the United States is Martin Luther King Day, and so here in California, thinking about 
the deep history of where I am right now, um, the Tongva history, which spans over seven millennia, uh, and and of course also how Martin Luther King and other civil rights leaders have um, just been monumental in how we talk about relationships and community today, um, particularly when it comes to comes to race. I think all of that is is heavy on my mind right now. Um, and and so yeah, I, I appreciate Viet uh, some of the things you said, especially around grief and relationships. And I know of, oftentimes when we think about community, we think about friendships. We're thinking about uh, kind of the the happy and lightness of things, or we like to. Uh, but I I like the definition of grief as a recognition that something mattered. Um, and right now we're all thinking about friends and family that. We haven't been able to see in a while and, and we're grieving that but um, i'm comforted by the fact that that grief exists really because we recognize that it matters right and and there's so many things that i think before the pandemic we thought mattered and we're not grieving them at all and uh, i think that says something too um so i uh i am in 2022 expelling um a lot of academic writing I did last year. And so I really appreciate this opportunity uh, and, and Annie for allowing me to actually write something from the heart, something personal um, to share as my presentation. Um, I'm, I'm gonna just read something that I wrote over the weekend uh, in response to the prompts of this program. And then I'll just for a couple of minutes share one of the recent projects that I've had a chance to curate to give you a bit of background on on who I am. But um, for those of you joining in who uh, I've never had the opportunity, the pleasure to meet, my name is Adriel Lewis. I am a writer. I'm an artist. I'm a curator. Uh, a lot of that curatorial work that I do is at the Asian Pacific American Center at the Smithsonian, and um, and it's surrounded with this increasingly heavy loaded term of community organizing and community-based arts practices. And uh, I think instead of kind of explaining that right now, I'll just sort of um, chip away at it uh, in the tradition of Noguchi uh, with this writing, with the sharing and with the conversations ahead. Um, so I'll go ahead and share my screen. What I've been enjoying doing is actually sharing the text as I, as I read. Um, so for those of you, if, if you prefer to read along, if you prefer to just sort of close your eyes, rest your eyes, do the dishes, I'll be reading for about seven to eight minutes before I start sharing some other visuals. All right, so, oops, there we go. Um, so I wrote this this weekend. Um, for those of you tuning in later on, we're currently on January 17th and I wrote it so the weekend prior. Dear Annie and Viet, I'm writing to you from amidst a tsunami. Last night, an underwater volcano erupted near Tonga and now all the beaches along the California coast are closed off, including here in Venice. Officials have warned residents to stay indoors, but if the last two years has taught us anything, it's that that sure as hell isn't happening. People would rather witness the destruction for themselves, even if it destroys them in the process. Me? I've been on lockdown since Omicron broke. Been playing it safe throughout this entire pandemic, but lately even my most careful friends have grown weary and are traveling and partying through the surge. There was a long period where I felt like I was part of a hyper-vigilant, well-researched brigade doing our part to save the world. Nowadays, I feel like the only guy playing dodgeball with a helmet. I recently spent my first Christmas ever not seeing my family and canceled a bunch of long awaited reunions with friends. In some cases, those reunions have proceeded without me. I know from the Instagram stories, which I watch with both horror and envy. I've been thinking about the shelf life of a relationship, whether it gradually stales if not regularly tended to by hand. 2020 could be taken as a sort of a grace period where our extroverted tendencies could take a breather, cryogenically frozen, along with student debt and airline miles. But 2021 felt less like an excuse. And this year, I wonder if everyone is wondering if I'm avoiding them. 
I want to trust that those dear to me know better than to question like this, but who knows who we've become since we last saw each other. Some have had babies who are now speaking their first words. Some managed to date and end up in long-term relationships. I've just been at home. It's getting harder to differentiate between quarantine and agoraphobia. I would draw commonalities between this form of consensual detainment and when Osama Noguchi volunteered to join his fellow Japanese Americans in concentration camps during World War II. But he sure was better at keeping in touch. In his cell, while his dual countries dueled, he managed to write tender letters to friends. Outside, it seems from the inside, history is taking flight and passes forever, he wrote to Man Ray. I, on the other hand, can hardly summon the energy to repost the tag. I've never been great at keeping in touch at a distance. It feels like too long a reach. I'm the kind of extrovert who needs the warmth of human energy, a shared space to backdrop the moment, the subconscious facial expressions and glasses clinking and spontaneous stand up and circle the room cackling with head cocked back and other acts of fellowship that are impossible to simulate over Zoom. Call me a Luddite, but I refuse to transfer love via the cloud. I yearn for the days when we can hug long and inhale our familiar musks and then tenderly sigh and lock eyes. My natural inclination is to wish for the impossible, Noguchi wrote to Ginger Rogers. He and I have some things in common after all. The lion's share of writing that Noguchi left behind are his correspondences to friends, colleagues, and clients, most of them driven by logistics more than love. I suppose we have that in common too. Spans of months and even years of my most heartfelt writing are buried in my outbox. As a writer, I'm guilty of having spent more time manicuring the wording on a grant application than I have on a love poem. There was a time when I wrote as if I was destined to be archived. I pored over thick anthologies of Sylvia Plath's adolescent diaries, where she commiserated over rejections from iconic publications and detailed her budding friendships with famous to be writers. I journaled nightly in flowery language, splicing cameos from artists I called friends, but who I was starstruck by all the same. In that sense, I was maybe an early adopter in today's culture of performative kinship, long before photo tagging was the new name dropping. At some point, it became difficult to tell whether I was documenting my life or just compiling a portfolio of acquaintances. I began to question whether I value the relationships or just the idea of having them. Through the pandemic, my most intimate moments have been spared from my public feeds. Should my experience of this ever, era ever be memorialized by way of my correspondences, absent from them would be the people I've spent the most time with. Most of those people, uh, one of those people is Nico, my roommate, who I'd also call my bandmate, if it weren't for the fact that we've not produced a single melody together over the two years we've shared this roof. We once toured the world together and recorded entire hard drives of music and made sure to blog about it daily. These days, our collaborations have manifested as slow cooked dinners, kale leaves with olive oil massaged into them, rice steamed with turmeric powder, countless salmon fillets imperfectly seared. There's something liberating about sharing a moment that will never be documented. These days where we have become our own paparazzi, perhaps an act of love is refraining from announcing it. Annie and Viet, I know that this isn't always the case. I do not want to downplay how genuinely I care for you, even if our friendships are often exercised in front of an audience, usually in institutional forums that require RSVPs and even registration fees. We cannot all be the cast of Grey's Anatomy, working in the same clinic all day and then gathering at the same bar after. We may not live together, split groceries, spend loads of time without detailed agendas attached, but that doesn't mean that we aren't kin. How many friendships built by collaboration carry the mantra, we really should hang out sometime, you know, outside of work? And how many talented people have I known and loved for years are only so-called collaborations being participating in the same mundane tasks? Is there an ideal ratio for a relationship to be productive versus casual? How important is it 
for a community to be recognized by those outside of that community? How deep is a love that never surfaces as public knowledge? I wonder this as I reflect on one of the first hot takes I learned about Noguchi's storied life, his affair with Frida Kahlo, oftentimes recalled in listicles of the painter's fiery romances. For my darling love, wrote Noguchi to Kahlo, at least according to a Vice article, there are rumors of failed attempts for the pair to move in together and the colorful image of a jealous Diego Rivera chasing Noguchi out of bed with a shotgun. How much of this was lived for the sake of becoming legend? Would they have rather been forgotten together? Maybe it's not up to us. Maybe it's not up to us how strangers in the future recall us, no matter how we try to control the narrative with our uploads and at symbols. Relationships, friendships, bonds, what are they if not elusive to those who were never part of them? Who are any of us if not ships passing? eventually succumbing to the tides of time, only to be remembered by the water. Annie, you asked what are defining aspects of a community. I'm tempted to suggest that the truest communities are those which never ask to be defined at all. Uh, so thank you for uh, allowing me to share some of my writing this, this uh, uh, weekend. Um, and actually, if I can keep the screen shared for just a little bit longer, um, I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to just share a little bit about sort of how this community curation manifests in, in my own work um, and how it's changed over the pandemic. Um, so um, as, as Annie and Viet mentioned, and as all of you know, uh, the last couple of years have resulted in a recognition of the rise in anti-Asian violence. And um, in response to the shootings that happened last March in Georgia, um, a dear friend and an artist, uh, Jess X Snow, uh, hit me up and asked if they could uh, you know, partner with me to uh, create a work in response to that, but, but not in a way that would necessarily re-trigger uh, memories of this violence, but really to think about the future and to bring the community together. And so um, in New York Chinatown, we partnered with the WOW Project, which is a Chinatown-based organization um, and a dear friend and collaborator, Mei Lum, and created this mural called In the Future, Our Asian Community is Safe, um, which exists, sorry for that, uh, exists out here uh, on Mott Street, uh, on Moscow and Mott Street. Um, this was painted in collaboration with um, youth and elders from throughout the community. It features the first land acknowledgement that's bilingual in Chinatown um, for Lenape Hoking, which is um, the original name of uh, the New York City area and beyond. Um, and just really quickly wanted to share some images of the unveiling, the, the rare moment that uh, we got to do that um, hugging and breathing in that, that uh, I described and that, and that uh, I think Viet uh, you know, described through some of the text that he was reading about like what friends that come together and recognize the limitations of our mortalities and of time. Um, this is Reagan de Loggins uh, from the Indigenous Kinship Collective who also came to share and open up the space. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like I'm a good hugger and I haven't really been able to, to, to flex that skill over the pandemic. So, um, you know, these images, I, I at times just sort of revisit and recall um, and sort of think into the future. You know, I feel like sometimes these visuals, uh, they, they describe what community means to me um, better than trying to come up with, um, with some set definitions. Um, and with that said, um, I'm really excited to be in conversation with Annie and Viet. Hi. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much, Viet, uh, for setting up uh, the provocation so helpfully for helping us frame the concepts of friendship and community. And also by doing that, you know, that you have kind of woven through those very experiences with friendship and community, you know, some historical and recent nodes and coordinates of those collaborations and wonderfully how they also interact with 
um, those art historical explorations of Noguchi and his partnerships. You know, and I think it was really lovely as well as a contrast, uh, Igro, um, after you keyed us in into remembering uh, the commemoration of Martha Luther King Day and the civil rights movement of solidarity, and then sharing with us this um, much very heartfelt reflections, uh, which really do resonate with me because I think, you know, we all have been through so much these last two years. Um, and, you know, when I met up with some friends recently here in London, uh, after not seeing them for two years, we all talked about how inevitably we were all thinking about the fact that when things have changed, our energy levels and resources are, you know, being questioned, uh, we have to rethink where we place our energies and our attentions and how we look after ourselves in that process, right? So there's, I would love to kind of just dig deeper into um, these um these these sort of like strands that you've you've kind of extricated and uh, maybe we can then look back at what that kind of inflects on how we understand friendship and community but i just want to say before we go into those images also made me think about that um I think that was an afternoon that we spent and spent a lot of money in Wing on Wall in 2019. Uh, so yeah, I still have uh, those wonderful pieces of ceramics actually that we, we got from Chinatown New in New York. So, I mean, I think it makes me think about time and, you know, being off our time That's in one of the videos you shared yet. Um, and I think back about, you know, when I was reading a lot about his correspondence uh, and his letters and how Noguchi and his friends experienced their interactions, not in a vacuum, of course, but across the kind of unfolding of events of their time, you know, after the Depression, during the kind of surge uh, of 1950s and 60s, and then into the kind of boomer uh, age of the 1980s. And we also experienced a very different moment of time, you know, uh, being born, I suppose, in the 1970s and 80s, you know, the US American legacies uh, from that generation, and also then this acceleration of technologies in the 90s with the internet and so on, that really changed the way we travel and how we access other people. And then of course, then now we have this pandemic, which has been sort of put a bookmark into that timeline, right? Um, and I guess, you know, I, this sort of makes me think about um, a quote from Li Wang Choi's article, where he talks about the assumption of love and how friendship, uh, you know, is, is a way of seeking discursive uh, density. And he says, you know, friends are the people with whom we have the most honest conversations and more important than agreement between friends is a set of shared references and experiences that provide the basis of a deep sympathy and which in turn allows for the most substantial criticisms and tests of understanding not only about general attitudes but also specific cases and so i guess you know with this it makes me think about how our relational interactions uh, do inspire us, but also, you know, in a way provide a mirror to how we're understanding ourselves, the world, and our place and our role in it. Now, I was just wondering whether you could also reflect on that a little bit more. Okay, I can mm -hmm. go briefly. I was really moved, um, Angel, by your writing and mm -hmm. this idea of shelf life and of ambivalence. Um, and actually in selecting some of the images, I thought of what you said in our meeting of kind of the best moments are not the project, the public face, but the meals. And so those are truly memorable. Um, and also to think about time, I was thinking back to our meeting and what we were talking about, um, or I was saying in terms of Noguchi actually very much, being very much of his time in terms of kind of this masculinist, um western new york centered art world but then also again back to ambivalence and ambiguity um not necessarily comfortable with that but then also performing that at the same time very um in some ways heteronormative um but then at the same time really questioning these timelines and also to think about um this idea of worldview right right now i i would argue we're in a kind of um decolonial as some other curators have termed it this global turn, but then what are our limits and, um, you know, and how do we reach through other modalities and friendships and, you know, it can be even, of course, as I've um, tried to argue for other thinkers that have passed um, that are also intimate in other ways. Um, so, yeah, and other kind of forms of writing and intimacy, but. Yeah, um, 
I'm just, uh, you know, thinking through, I mean, yeah, what, what you're saying, I mean, bringing in more terminology that I think um, right now has been, has been batted around more often than, than before, like what it means to be decolonial um, and, and really like anything that we do in, in the art world or in, you know, within these institutional forums. But um, one of the things that I've been really, you know, that, that, that I've always struggled with over the, the last seven or eight years, I've been at the Smithsonian. Um, you know, prior to working at the Smithsonian, I was a full-time artist, um, you know, and, and really it was very natural to want to create and organize with friends um, or on the other side, you know, uh, collaborate with people uh, as a bridge towards friendship, you know, like really kind of selecting not only based on um, talent, but based on kind of like just who do you want to spend your time with um you know in in the institutional world sometimes that can be considered a conflict of interest uh and the conflict of interest or the realm of conflict of interest grows uh as i keep on falling in love with everybody i collaborate with <laughs> you know and so um I, I think that that's that's one of the things that that uh institutions are really wrestling with, you know, especially as they are um, bringing on more people um, into, you know, either as contractors or on staff, uh, bringing on people who aren't necessarily attached to Rolodexes as much as they're attached to communities. And these are the communities that institutions either claim or desire to be a part of, but then upon entering the institution, we're in some ways asked to detach or distance ourselves. And, and it hurts, you know, like it, it really hurts to, to do that. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm curious, you know, like in kind of just thinking through these definitions of friendship and community, and then also throwing in, you know, like decolonial practice into it, um, you know, where do you see sort of the cracks where we can actually kind of like do this work and, um, you know, kind of change the anatomy of what it means to be part of an artistic community? Um, yeah. Um, thank you for that, Adriel. I mean, it's, oh gosh, when you say it hurts, like it does, I mean, well, first I want to talk about like, okay, good memory, like when you talk about food memories, um, you know, that, that when we look back at our time, uh, I realize that sometimes I don't remember those times when uh, I've delivered a piece of work, for example, but I remember the times when we've had a meal and I remember the time when you discovered salted chicken, salted egg chicken in, in Singapore. And you were like, what is this stuff? And you wanted to eat it every meal. Um, you know, I remember that, right? Um, you shouldn't eat it every meal, but. Yes. Well, we I guess. <laughs> um, and I remember that, of course, uh, alongside then the times when it's difficult. And I think, you know, I think you've you've brought up a really good point where sometimes we can sort of embed ourselves in communities where um, collaboration happens and there's a lot of solidarity because resources are scarce and people work together and they build up trust um, and because of trust um, people then you know maybe pass you materials or trust you with their work and so on and so it really um, creates a culture of working where people are much more um, amenable to uh, trusting each other and wanting to work together. And sometimes that can encounter a different work culture from a different institution based in a different part of the world. And certainly, you know, when that comes up, it can be very painful because you may bring in, you know, the work of this community to that institution, but the institution sees you as a broker. You know, how do we get more out of these people by paying less, you know, or reneging on fees or, you know, doing things that you you know that you can't really agree with. And then you find yourself in this position where, you know, who are you friends with, the institution or the community? And, you know, and you didn't imagine that it would be so sort of, that you would be caught in between in that way when you first thought, here's that wonderful opportunity, right? And so I think a lot of the work that we are trying to do in the colonial practice 
um, is not just raising visibility of the work of these communities, but also the conditions of how we work with the communities, right? To, and, and I look back also in Noguchi, you know, and learning a lesson from him, uh, what he went through, right? When he agreed to enter the concentration camps voluntarily, thinking he could do something good for the community there that he identified with in solidarity. But when he had entered the camps, he realized he didn't have the resources and, you know, his uh, pleas, you know, uh, were met with sort of deaf ears. And so therefore he wasn't resourced to do the things that he wanted to do in the right way. So, you know, I, that is a really um, one of the, you know, reminders for myself, like when I'm working with institution and, and bringing in a community that has uh, considerably less, uh, I suppose, cultural power in that sense, you know, in terms of who's being paid and so on, like how do we negotiate and make sure that those terms are equitable for everyone? And I think, um, I think that's also when I've really learned where my friends are, you know, <laughs> when you realize that who you share the same values with and who's willing to kind of um, stand shoulder to shoulder with you in those sort of negotiations. I appreciate this idea of cracks and, you know, what gets lost. And a new Vikram talks about institutions um, and you know, again, this idea of community is one of those words, but also diversity when you think of um, institutions, museums, galleries, the front of the house, which this is what she writes about versus back house, the front of the house might quite, uh, might appear quite diverse, full of different community members, but the back of the house, the foundation, the curators, right, there's no real substantive change. So what happens between those cracks, right, and what is that loss, and as I was arguing for my short presentation, this idea of loss as not something that necessarily has to be overt, has to be shown. Um, that's a slow timeline, a slow cooking that's not, you know, about always being in the streets, but maybe about, you know, sitting at home, being antisocial, writing, thinking, etc. That that is a form of embodiment and that is generative. Um, and what can that yield beyond, you know, is there really a decolonial, right? Is that ever possible when we are always complicit within that. I mean, these forms, these forums, right, that these, um, and then also back to, again, to this figure of Noguchi, why have there been so many institutional engagements? And those were just like a very fraction of, you know, within my own life, um, the engagements as the embodiment of a certain East and West, right, but then also very much uh, kind of, um, you know, Far East, not Far East, but, you know, East Asian, Japanese, Chinese, which, you know, within terms of, kind of Asian American history, uh, in terms of dominance and representation versus other histories that have been subsumed, um, indigenous history, Southeast Asian histories. So this fetishization, what, what we actually, I think, within time and space get called to do become, you know, representative figures of certain communities. And you know, this is, uh, back to what Adrian was saying, this ambivalent, um, reckoning, but at the same time, it's still important work as you um, are talking about, Annie. And um, how do we learn strategically from others that have gone before? And um, right, and what are the cracks that we can further open up? But I'm not sure about in terms of your strategies, in terms of like, you know, pandemic, self-care. And I, I think I was really moved by the question you um, brought up in closing in our kind of pre-meeting in terms of like, um, I don't remember exactly, but just kind of um, opening up and love and care and, you know, all that relationships. Um, that's, I don't I think it's beyond strategies, right? And I think it's about this kind of relationality that's amorphous, which I can't really quite pinpoint. Maybe it's really grief. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I mean, the, so the language of, of the cracks is something I borrow from uh, Dr. Bayo Akamolafe, um, who, you know, really kind of describes, you know, now, now that activism has been named and packaged, uh, you know, what, what, is, what is beyond, beyond that, and, and he, he uh, uses the terminology of fugitivity. Um, and so the idea of the cracks and fugitivity is basically like, there is no settling, you know, like the idea of just sort of kind of being able to stay put is colonial in itself, right? And so, um, and I think, you know, with both of you, Annie and Viet, and, um, you know, all the conversations we've had and all the work we do around transnational and, well, now that word is being used, so what's the other thing? And, you know, uh, you know, 
like I, I think it's something that especially migrants and re refugees um, folks who are um, displaced or constantly displaced we're used to it we know that there's sort of like you know you kind of just get into a zone of just flowing right um, and I think that you know, these kinds of conversations where we're trying to pinpoint and define, you know, like it's it's necessary. And at the same time, part of it is, you know, we're we're undoing the doing, right? Like we sort of know that by speaking in these forums, by doing the work behind the institutions that we are uh, normalizing terms that were once considered radical or even controversial, we know that part of that means that we also then have to find the next thing. And, and those are the cracks, right? And, and, and that's really, I think, you know, when, when you talk about Viet, the idea of community being a process and a journey, um, you know, I think that to me, that's, that's part of the process, right? Like, and, and I think that I've actually, over the last couple of years, come to appreciate and enjoy the fact that um, you know, it's it's this searching. You know, like it's th this is the road trip that we're all kind of in in together, um, and and em embracing that I think is is um, you know something that I'm I'm really grateful to be able to share with you. Yeah, I think you know loss is really interesting. I suppose because there are always these two sides of the same coin that get parlayed around, right? We talk about love and hate. We talk about loss, absence, presence, and so on. And um, because I sort of had a very unexpected um, experience as well the last two years of not being able to get back to London, uh, where I, you know, I thought I was going to be away for three months and then ended up being away for two years. And certainly that really reconfigured like how I was thinking about my time because I was very fortunate. I was continuing to work digitally um, so I was kind of living on sort of European time zone, but being very much based in Southeast Asia. And, you know, that experience also was really interesting, like how our friendships continuing through the pandemic, you know, how are we offering each other support, even though we can't convene as easily as we used to, you know, so there was certainly the loss, the loss of like that kind of physical enjoyment of being spatially with your friends and and you know spending time together and sharing a bottle of wine and, and so on and having long conversations and then you know but navigating a different way of reaching out and being friends with each other but i think there were also different lessons of proximity you know because uh while i was away you know there were different occasions where i would share space with people that i didn't know very well who i wouldn't you know uh sort of at the start call friends uh, and even now, you know, it takes time, I think, to kind of nurture, you know, what you feel comfortable as friendship. Right? But certainly we started to realize like we were all in the same boat, you know, people who were close in proximity, but also far away from people that we were close to. And everyone was going through this whole uncertainty and a lot of the anxieties around the pandemic and jobs and parents and so on. And so then you start thinking about care as something that is just about the proximity, the, the radius around you, right? What's your duty of care to the radius of people around you? You may not know each other very well. You may not necessarily agree on a lot of things or like everything about each other, but what are some of the basic decencies that we would want to carry out? Because we are all, um, we want we all want to survive and also move beyond that, right? I love the way Abel, you always say, let's not just survive, let's thrive, right? <laughs> and so there's something about sharing energies with the people around us. And what does that do? You know, how do we warm their seat for them, you know, uh, in that way? So you know, I've been thinking a lot about that, I think, in how we operate and the way we move around the world. Go ahead, Adrian. Oh, I was just going to say, um, you know, that that point, Annie, about um, surviving versus thriving it. Um, I don't remember when I said it to you, whether it was before or during the pandemic, it, it just means something so different, you know, like than it may have at, at a certain point. I, I think, you know, uh, another keyword I've been thinking about lately is liberation and um, Nico, who I mentioned in my writing. Um, you know, oftentimes when, when, when I've got a tough decision, whether it's like picking up a gig that I'm not sure if I want to do or something like that, you know, his, his question to me is always, um, what makes you feel free? Um, you know, what, 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 what's the, what's the way to do it that would make you feel free? And, 
um, in in meditating on that question in as many decisions as possible, I, I I've come to recognize how much I make decisions based on fear. You know, like and to make a decision based on fear is vying merely for survival, right? As opposed to making a decision um, that would free you, which is one of abundance and one of one of thriving, right? And so, yeah, that that was just kind of something I wanted to wanted to drop in there because um, I think that that abundance is something that I'm really interested in how you all are locating, especially right now, you know, with with um, you know things sometimes feeling very sparse, especially when it comes to human connection with, with those that, that we would like to see more. Yeah, and the logic of capitalism is one of scarcity versus abundance. And I'm really inspired by this idea of thriving and liberation. And back to this idea of loss, you know, from my personal example as a boat refugee, when I left Vietnam, that was precisely you lost everything, right? Like you, you lost your country, you lost your sense of identity. But then within, let's say, this framework of liberation or enlightenment, that's very much the point to lose the sense of self, to lose your bearings. And I think this is what the pandemic has been doing, um, disorienting us in profound ways. And right, that's the whole point to kind of really lose this, this kind of grasping, this accumulation, this logic. And what does it really mean to be fully yourself fully to be in community to fully care um and to truly be precarious and also i you know i'm fangirling um just because of the terms about loss friendship community i was reading the past um few months you know um uh, alexander chi's book uh how to write an autobiography of a novel he talks about hiv aids but he also talks about this one moment where um in terms of care and friendship he was teaching a class and the students were saying what does this matter right we're in a time of crisis what does art and activism matter but in the piece he writes that the processing of it the thinking about it is a radical revolutionary act that of course profoundly it matters it's all of our ancestors right here with us and so that really opened my eyes to again i was plugging you know this amazing kind of show to think about what these losses generate and you know maybe there's a void but that void is exactly that crack you're talking about that opens up again um, other generative possibilities yeah I'm, I'm so grateful yet that you kind of went into those spaces to to raise you know the notion of grief and loss because we don't often want to talk about that i think normally you know we, we prefer to speak uh, in more celebratory terms but i think grief and loss um has been experienced you know quite intensely worldwide and i think we all probably know someone also who has passed away due to COVID, um and you know uh, a colleague and friend, Sri Bandal, and in Batambong in Cambodia, passed away not so long ago, and that was such a, a loss for us because you know he was a an amazing uh, artist and soul, and you know was such a great influence on the younger generation of artists that he taught. And you know, and you know, you certainly feel the loss when you think, you know, his work is not done. <laughs> I was expecting to see more work from him, you know, uh, and I was so honored to have had the privilege to work with him over the years. And so I think all of us are um, accommodating loss. And I, and I read something that was really beautiful. I, you know, having gone through uh, a lot of personal loss myself as well, my family, um, that how, you know, we don't necessarily get over loss. I think that was this thing that I read and I'm paraphrasing it. it so a lot less gracefully than a writer. Um, but it was this kind of image about how you know we 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 kind of feel like we need to paper over the loss or to get over and heal uh, around the loss, and this writer was suggesting that we don't really do that that the loss never really goes away, but we actually enlarge around the loss and somehow we become more capacious in our kind of mental and heart space around that loss and perhaps the loss then um, provides different coordinates. In, in order to navigate a kind of uh, a, a reality that itself becomes a lot more complex as well. And maybe that becomes more meaningful. And just from a personal level, I think, you know, I have a lot of friends that 
I do call friends, but I kind of know them as my art friends, for example. Like we, you know, work together or we uh, talk about art and we go to art shows. But certainly when I encountered a lot of personal loss, you know, and then suddenly we traverse this territory where it's unusual because then friends come in to offer support and are walking with you through um, these questions of mortality and time and what does it mean to be on this planet, it, it takes on a different inflection and, you know, and <sighs> continue to resonate. And I'm still trying to also fully understand it, but I know it was very transformative. Yeah, like, I mean, what, what you're saying, Annie, um, you know, about about grief and, and loss, it, it kind of makes me think, I mean, and I feel like this is also a good way to returning back to Noguchi in one of the clips that Viet showed us, like, but it, what, what you were talking about with loss and, and grief makes me think about grief as perhaps like this, this quantum portal, right? Like, I feel like maybe I'm just watch, watching like too much like Loki and, and Marvel movies, but it's like, you know, in grief, you're, you're grieving the loss of the presence in like some other multiverse where the loss didn't happen, right? Because for example, we, we lose somebody we love um all the experiences and everything that led up to that we didn't lose that right that's that sits there exactly where it is um it's really sort of you know uh, what what could uh, could we have been doing together right now and also what are all the things into the future so then grief becomes this portal into the future um and this idea Annie, that that you mentioned of of opening up um you know i, I don't know if i'm misinterpreting the the clip that Viet showed of Noguchi talking about this present moment and, you know, who knows whether you're supposed to stay within the present moment or escape the present moment. But when he talks about sort of this idea of not being confined by presence and everything opens up, you know, in relation to grief, I'm thinking about, um, you know, when, when you then see time as this continuum and what you have and that you never lost um, is everything that led up to um, to this relationship being had and experienced from sort of the tiniest atoms coming together to form this universe, right? And then it becomes such an expansive thing that that we have, and and um, maybe as opposed to looking into the multiverse, or maybe in addition to looking into the multiverse of the present or into the future and all the things that we're losing or feel like we've lost of the future, we can also kind of unpack maybe a lot of the past that. Um, maybe we didn't really take the time or energy to appreciate in, in those relationships or those things that we grieve. Yeah, I also think about um, in terms of lost grief, you know, it's, it's something I've been haunted for the majority of my life, but, you know, I, I discovered through thinking about it, you know, Joan Didion, you know, who also passed away in her book, The Year of Magical Thinking, talks about kind of coming back to the site again and again. And then Freud talks about the melancholic, you know, you kind of are grounded in your grief and then you just circle back to it. And then you're supposed to work your way through it, as you were suggesting. But actually, I argue there is no working through for, especially if you're subaltern feeling the weight of, you know, institutional violence, you're not you know, as Sarah Ahmed writes about in The Promise of Happiness, you're not going to be happy and cheerful, right? I mean, you're going to feel the feels, and that's perfectly okay. Um, and so, I, you know, in my creative work and writing, I really argue for that you, we really need to delve into some of this difficult, the shadow stuff, as Young writes about the discomfort, and that, again, yields a actually an abundance, right? Because it's not one or the other. And it's when you look at it closely, it becomes something else, um, something radically um, different and not just this melancholic kind of preoccupation, um, right? That's something because you have to kind of, you know, back to these kind of um, Marvel Star Wars analogy, kind of like embrace the dark side, the light, it's not, you know, the dark or the light, it's, it's kind of, both. And then I think with the Noguchi clip, he's talking really about kind of the this framework of time, I feel like, and he's always fighting, I guess, of course, in his um, relationship and his exchanges with um, Bucky Fuller, right? You know, Bucky's really, even though was at the apex of kind of um, 
uh, modernist logic, but also really through quantum physics, et cetera, like exploded, right? This idea of, again, the kind of minuscule, the, the, the tiny, tiny ad atomic, you know, we're all kind of related in these different ways. And, you know, through observation, through, as you were talking about earlier in our other conversation, speaking nearby, just being within presence, even if it's not physical presence, it's a act of solidarity. Yes, uh, and I think, you know, speaking of grief, I guess, also, we were talking about decay, you know, and the kind of natural shelf life, the timeline for something. And it also made me think about, I suppose, our intergenerational uh, kind of ancestral memories and histories. Um, I think, you know, like Ocean Vong's work as well, right? Uh, on Earth, we are briefly gorgeous. And it also made me think about how when you know, you have family bereavement, you always have this sort of moment of regret as well, you know, that, oh, we didn't get to finish that, we didn't get to resolve that, which then, of course, brings to light that there are some things that won't actually be resolved in our lifetimes as well, no matter how much we sort of want it to be, right? So um, I think, it, you know, it, it goes back to also something that, I think a book that you you bought me, Adriel, about geological time, you know, realizing that actually, you know, there, I guess our, uh, own specific time is actually just a, a really brief moment, a brief flare up, you know, uh, against a kind of long geological time span. But I guess that also gives hope in that sense, because it, the, the weight of resolving everything isn't uh, on us as individuals, but we are part of like a really long story, you know, a, a, a long and complex story. And also, I think, you know, in thinking about loss, and then also joy, and, and how all that relates together. Um, I recently read a lovely book by Kathy Park Hong as well, called Minor Feelings, you know, and how there are these variegations of emotions. And I think sometimes even when we are remembering joy, there are also shades and tones of loss and grief amidst that too. And embracing all of that is something um, that's part of, I suppose, the lived experience and the acknowledgement of histories, especially for diasporas, you know. So I think there's something about that that I think I'm still trying to grapple within myself and accept. But I think broadening that, I suppose, because we say friendship and community, but we've used these words quite interchangeably sometimes. And I wonder, you know, how I suppose we could think more consciously of like, how do we bring in these values of friendship into community? Uh, and in a way, Viet, you also brought up through your presentation uh, and in the meeting we had before, you know, this acknowledgement that it is when we have community that we can start thinking about the power of a certain identity and positionality and what kind of social change we want to make. So I, I was wondering whether you would like to share more about that. Sure, I think it's an in, intentionality and this is why I love the work that Global Asia Exchange um, does, you know, putting us all together because as Alex um, noted, we may be working in these institutions in different parts of the world and we're siloed, right? We're kind of replicating or rehearsing some of the same struggles around visibility or not having to choose to do that or wanting to do that. And so, but being within these networks, right, both physical and virtual, um, it takes, I feel like it takes institutional, intentional, long-term um, love, if that's what you call it. And um, and also I want to think, you know, briefly again, back to, you know, institutions can be sites of trauma. And um, also to what you were saying in terms of kind of um, generational grief, like there's kind of scientific uh, studies that show now that, you know, generational ancestral grief, trauma, et cetera, you know, is embodied in our DNA. It's not just this kind of like, oh, I feel these things. And so that's inherited, you know, physically, but then that's also inherited institutionally. And so a lot of my work for the first part of my life, and as I shared with you um, in the personal uh, meeting that, you know, I was on medical leave for a long time because I think I fully just ingested that and could not metabolize and could not transform that. I think a lot of the work now is really about, you know, shifting away from this traumatized discourse and, you know, as some other, um, Sandra Ingerman, who's a shaman, talks about transmutation, you just turn on that light, right, Focus, as you were suggesting, Adriel, on thriving in abundance, right, it's not like this kind of, we've been um, dispossessed, it's very important to know those histories and not to forget that, 
but then this kind of central melancholic preoccupation with that can prevent us from seeing these other abundances. And so I think some of this institutional work, right, that we're doing, it's not like dismantling, right? It's not always kind of, um, you know, of course, Audre Lorde, et cetera, to kind of entirely, because you can't do that. Fanon says you can't do that because as post-colonial um, subalterns, you know, you take it away, we just replicate it. But then how do you think about it in different ways? Again, I just love this idea of like embolicism and, and kind of um, imperceptibility, but I'm rambling. <laughs> Um, you're not rambling yet. And, and, and actually, I, I feel like that the rambling is kind of when, and kind of the, the GC stuff comes out, you know, especially in these kinds of forums, you know, where we've got timing, we've got recording, you know, this, the, the, the red clock ticking. Um, and I don't know, I mean, it's, I, when you were talking, I was just thinking, you know, again, about, about, uh, you know, when we're trying to come up with a definition of like friendship, um, uh, the only reason why we need to is because we're sort of in these in these forums, right? Like I don't know. I mean, it's a different conversation when you're among friends, you know, like uh, and kind of discussing the nature of friendship um, in sort of like a closed a closed space, a, a, a private space that that isn't supposed to sort of like affect the academic field of friendship or something like that, right? Um, I mean, I, I was just thinking about how, um, yeah, like with, for example, weeds, um, you know, how, how, where the weeds come in, in, in a garden is, is not about taking over a plant, right? If you imagine like a tree as like an institution or an institutional knowledge, right? It's, it's not so much about replacing and then, and then, and then dominating in that sense, but really more about like finding all the other places where you can sprout until it becomes its own forest, right? Um, and I, th I think about that when it comes to, you know, this constantly trying to sort out like, well, what is it? Because, you know, what is this connection that we share? Because I thought it was friendship, but now the way that the friendship is defined by so, so and such, um, you know, doesn't seem to match. Community, I thought I knew what my community was, but according to X institution community is this, and I don't feel like it's it's that, right? And so you're constantly kind of creating these openings and creating opportunities, uh, you know, like creating new words and terms and things like that for people to latch onto, to sort of use, digest, and then and then compost. Um, you know, I I feel like that's I don't know. I I I, I used to find it really um, stressful, but I'm I'm starting to kind of recognize that that's sort of just. That's that's the job. <laughs> like that's, that's... <laughs> to continue this analogy of plant life, as um, friend recommended, Annie Singh's mushroom at the end of the world, mm -hmm. and yeah. to think about kind of the hidden networks that um, are rhizomatic and that continue, and that these intimacies, you know, back to Foucault, he really argues for. This idea of friendship is actually, you know, the, I mean, I'm really always interested in querying these terms. What do you mean by community? What do you mean by friendship? What do you mean by like these histories? And so he argues for this, I, you know, in that interview, as I read it, kind of this perversity, right? Um, sex positivity. We have these bounds, which is like, this is appropriate for friendships, right? But what does it mean to kind of be more intimate, to treat your friend like a lover? right, um, to treat your community as a sort of kind of um, intimate relation. And what does that do when we take away kind of this hetero or homonormative framing and these kind of, again, these kind of really, kind of this is traumatic narrative, this is progress. And, but how do you kind of make it kind of queerly perverse? How do you um, infuse, you know, as Douglas Crimp, I talked about, you know, mourning and militancy, um, times of grief with kind of other explosive, uh, maybe pun intended kind of desires, right? That allows for joy, but also um, for many things. And, and, and again, this like compost that nothing ever dies as a book by Viet Nguyen suggests that, you know, I, my father passed away many years ago, but I feel like, we're still in contact and many of these thinkers and artists Noguchi among them although sometimes problematic right really you know are here with us today 
Thank you. And I think, you know, just thinking about how something remains generative, you know, even if it doesn't come to fruition or even if it then, you know, has, has slid into back into the earth, um, it's funny, I, I wanted to bring up, actually I had sort of planned to talk about uh, Noguchi's model for the friendship fountain that was never realized, you know. Uh, so for those who don't, who are not aware, I read about how Noguchi um, wanted to create this 150 foot structure, right? I think it, the way it was described, it looked like it would have a fan of some kind and at night they would shine, uh, they would spray water on it and also illuminate it. And so you've got this giant basically what's it like a giant sprinkler you know that's illuminated so you've got a beautiful sort of spray of light and water around the area um, and of course this sculpture never came to fruition but when I was reading about it it you know as a metaphor it seemed really beautiful this idea that you know it was so indiscriminate in some way that it was also trying to share around its proximity and radius you know um to become itself a source of refreshment or a source of joy you know of fun because suddenly the image made me think oh it would be so fun to dance underneath that you know you could have a party underneath that right so i think also that how that's funny because there you have like um an artist's plan that never came to fruition, but continues to inspire, you know? And so I think that also is something that I take away with us. I mean, sadly we've run out of time, but I feel like we've only just started. So I really hope that we will continue to be in conversation uh, outside of this as well, because as we all know, like there are always conversations on and offline. <laughs> so I look forward to that again, but thank you so much for joining us um, and really just, yeah, framing this beautiful sort of affective condition that we could uh you know think about more deeply but i also want to take this moment to thank the barbican and its amazing team uh, flores ostend and for the uh, noguchi museum who has been supporting this project as well well thank you so much thank you thank you everybody yes you guys thank you so much.